Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Sister Wives with Mary Jane Kay. Let's get right into this episode, Sister Wives Season 4, Episode 6, Four Wives, Four Valentines. It's Valentine's Day and Cody has to buy flowers for his wives. He also takes his daughters to the daddy-daughter Valentine's dance. The Browns are also meeting with their loan officer to figure out if they can get into these homes. The episode starts with Mary explaining, yet again, how a few months ago, Robin offered to be her surrogate since she and Cody have failed to have a baby together since Leo was born. Mary and Cody visit another fertility doctor for a second opinion. And the doctor tells Mary at her age, her eggs are depleted and the ones left are of a lower quality. Since we are all born, of course, with a finite number of eggs. Mary could always choose to use donor eggs if she can't get pregnant with her own eggs, but that's not an option for Mary. Cody explains that the doctor spent lots of time harping on the donor egg issue. That's not something Mary wants to do. The only way she wants to do this is with her parts and Cody's parts. Mary tells the doctor she is at a point where she wonders if she wants to start completely over. And Cody raises his brow at this. He looks alarmed. He looks surprised. Mary's options are to get further testing or she can just not. She can drop it. Mary is still considering the timing and she isn't sure she wants to start all over again. At this point, Mary doesn't have a decision yet. She isn't swayed one way or the other. She needs more time to figure this out. Over at Christine's, she is getting her girls ready for the daddy-daughter Valentine's dance. The elementary school is hosting the Valentine's Day dance for parents and their children. So Cody's kids asked him to take them. As Christine is doing Isabel's hair, she asks Gwendolyn why she asked Logan to be her date. Gwen wanted her own date instead of sharing her date with all of the other girls. Gwen says she isn't that good with sharing and she isn't going to be a polygamist when she grows up. Gwen is smart even as an elementary school aged kid she sees how complicated and unfair polygamy can be and she probably has seen her mom struggle as one of four wives sharing her husband. Also Gwen probably notices she doesn't get enough time and attention from her dad. So even in elementary school, she knows polygamy is not for her. And she advocated for herself. She knew all the girls were going with her dad and she wasn't down to share. And she probably knew some of the girls, most likely the royal girls, will be monopolizing her dad's attention. So whether it was Cody blatantly favoring the royal girls or them being more needy like their mom, Gwen knows the deal. So she got her own date. Christine is surprised that Gwen has already decided she won't live as a polygamist later on in life at such a young age. Logan says he thought it was cute that Gwen, his little sister, asked him to go to the dance. So he is playing the role of big brother and he is going to go to the dance with Gwen and he is pretty sure it made her day. I have a feeling it made her whole life. She was so excited. It was adorable. Christine tells Gwen that she wouldn't have her dad unless she lived polygamy. And she also points out to Gwen that if it weren't for polygamy, Gwen wouldn't be inviting her brother Logan to the dance. All the girls are getting ready and Savannah looks adorable. She is so excited about going to the dance with Cody. She really wants to dance with her dad. Robin has asked Mary to come over and be involved watching the girls get ready. Mary is also going to take all the pictures, of course. Robin adds that all the little girls in the family love Mary. They adore her. Mary gives a perspective Robin, Christine, and Janelle don't give. So Robin wanted Mary to be there. Aurora is very excited. She's very hyper. She's excited to dance with her dad, of course. All the girls are over the moon because they probably rarely, if ever, get an experience to hang out one-on-one -on -one or in a small group getting attention from their dad. Mary points out that the four separate homes in Vegas has not molded the family together as a family. Mary doesn't feel like she is a mom figure to most of the younger kids. She feels like all she is is just one of dad's wives, like a visitor in their home. So that means nothing to them, and that's hard for Mary. Robin wants her kids to have the exposure of Mary as a mother to them. 
Christine says, everybody wants to live closer to each other again, right next to each other. And she says, for all the kids, especially for the younger ones, they have to make this happen. The kids need to interact more as brothers and sisters and not just friends. And right now with the four separate homes, there's a friend relationship, but it's not a sibling relationship among the brothers and sisters. Cody explains that this is why they are pushing to get the four homes in the cul-de-sac so they can function more like a family. Cody loved, of course, how excited all the girls were to go to the dance with him. He says he doesn't even know if his teenage girls would get as excited about doing something with him, but the little girls were so excited. In other words, it was easy, it was convenient taking his youngest girls to this dance where they were over the moon and thrilled just to get attention from him. And they lavished Cody with attention and praise and love. With the teenage girls, Cody has to work harder. He has to make an effort to connect and communicate. He has to probably receive constructive criticism. It's not all hearts and doe eyes, and that's probably why Cody doesn't do special things with the older kids. It's too inconvenient, and he isn't sure what type of reception he will get, but he probably knows he won't feel like the hero. Cody doesn't seem excited to be spending time with his kids for his kids' sakes. He is happy. His youngest daughters are so happy to be around him. It's so easy, and he gets to eat up this ego feast. It's not about his kids. It's about Cody. And later, Cody refers to himself as a hero. From Cody's perspective, it seems like this dance is about what it does for his ego. More than how this dance benefits his girls. This feels like it's not about his kids, it's really about him. Cody and Aurora are dancing and Gwen is on the sidelines and she looks annoyed watching them. She has this look on her face. She probably knew Robin's daughter would monopolize Cody's time and attention. Cody proudly explains that at the dance, the demand was sky high. Everybody wanted a piece of him. Everybody wanted their time with him. Everybody wanted a dance. Cody loved seeing his kids chomping at the bit for their attention from dad. Cody's ego loves this to bits and pieces. Logan says, once Gwen broke out of her shell when she got out of her shy box, which usually she doesn't have up, it was great. He and Gwen had fun. Apparently, with dancing, Gwen gets shy. Cody split several dances, sharing them with all of his daughters so he could dance with all of them without worrying about what anybody thought of him because his four daughters here with him tonight thought he was the hero. That came straight from Cody's mouth. See how Cody is mentioning how his daughters saw him as a hero? Cody only wants to be an invested father to his kids when he is the hero, when they cook ego feasts for their dad and sing his praises. The second they have criticism, the second he has to make an effort when it's not easy, the second he isn't the infallible hero, the second it gets inconvenient, the second he becomes imperfect, the second he senses he isn't the hero, the white knight, Cody disengages from his kids. And in an interview, Peyton did a while back, he mentioned how Cody loves the kids when they are small and he is perfect in their eyes, the hero. But as the kids grow up, he pays less and less attention. He invests less as things become less convenient and less easy for him. When the kids notice their dad isn't the hero, he isn't perfect. And at that point, Cody will distance himself. Cody had fun at the dance where he didn't have to worry about what anybody thought of him because these four girls of his thought he was the hero and he got the limelight. It's Valentine's Day, so now Cody is chasing down Valentine's Day stuff on the day, specifically flowers. And he says it's been a challenge figuring out what wife likes what flowers, what each wife's favorites are. He has been with Mary, Janelle, and Christine for almost 20 years at this point. So there have been almost 20 birthdays, anniversaries, Valentine's Days, and Cody is still challenged by what their favorite flowers are. He can't remember. He doesn't know. 
I could understand when you're dating or maybe like the first few times you get your wife flowers, maybe not being sure what they prefer. But after decades, how can you not know unless you don't ever get them flowers and gifts? It really shouldn't be a challenge unless Cody never gets them flowers. And maybe this is one of the first times right here on camera for the filming opportunity. This guy doesn't know his kids' ages, he forgets their birthdays, and after almost 20 years of marriage, this guy doesn't know the favorite flowers of each wife. It's a challenge, and I think it's because he never gets them flowers, and he is just using this filming opportunity to show what a considerate, loving husband he is. Cody explains to the flower shop lady that he needs flowers for his wives. And when he says wives, plural, she was smiling and her smile just fades immediately. The shop owner explains she usually doesn't see one man coming in to buy four floral arrangements for four wives, but it's not for her to judge. It's more money for her. Hell, if Cody had 10 wives, even better. Cody points to an arrangement on a table and he says this would be for Mary, something like that. He picks another arrangement for Janelle, he just points at a table, but for Robin, magically Cody knows the specific flower types he needs. Freesia and black magic. Yes, get the black magic so the goblin can do a ritual with the voodoo dolls in her creepy dollhouse when all of her manipulations and vision boards don't work in getting her the deference or the relationships she feels entitled to get the black magic cody is getting christine purple roses she likes lavender and fire and ice i'll bet you the reason cody knows christine's flowers is she told him ahead of time just like she picked out her christmas gift the ring and cody just paid for it the wives are meeting up at mary's house to plan the family valentine's day party they're going to do fondue Robin tells Christine that she was told Valentine's Day dinner was at her house. I like how Robin says, I was told, as if she is irritated she wasn't consulted. She was just told where it would be, and she didn't get to stick her goblin hands into it to demand what she prefers. Robin says, someone asked her if Cody just splits Valentine's Day up into fourths. All the wives find that super amusing, and Christine explains, that more than anything, Valentine's Day is definitely not a polygamist holiday. The Browns celebrate Valentine's Day as a family. They don't make Valentine's Day cards for polygamists, and typically that stuff isn't done for Valentine's Day. Cody jokes, I love you and you and you and you with all my heart. Robin had a crazy idea of attacking Cody's car and decorating it for Valentine's Day. Janelle thinks that's a good idea. She says it'll be sort of like a big Valentine's Day card to decorate Cody's brand new car. Christine asks how they're going to decorate it. She likes the idea of helium balloons so that when Cody opens the door, the whole thing of balloons just comes out of the car. Let's hope if the balloons fly away that they're environmentally safe balloons. Mary thinks Cody will be amused by this. She doesn't think Cody will be mad. He might roll his eyes, but ultimately she thinks he'll find it funny. They're going to borrow Cody's car and take it to another wife's house to decorate it. And then they're going to drive it back. And then Robin will say she thinks she scratched the car. So Cody will come out and see the surprise. Cody loves his brand new midlife crisis luxury car. He loves all of his midlife crisis cars, and he seems very OCD about them. Telling Cody the car is scratched will switch his mood. And even though it's harmless fun and a sign of affection, Cody doesn't chill easily. Telling him the car is scratched is going to make him moody. It might dampen the mood. Robin is going to say, I think I scratched something. Can you come look at it, please? She delivers it very innocently, of course, practicing in front of the wives. And Mary asks Robin if she can lie, though. Not only can Robin lie, she can manipulate, too. She is very good at facades and artifice and customer service. Let's remember, Robin is married to her best customer. She knows very well how to blow smoke and schmooze. It was a very interesting question, Mary asking, Robin, can you lie, though? 
Robin answers, oh yes, at first very seriously, and then she smiles and she says she is kidding. This woman can lie and manipulate with ease, and it shows from what we see on the show at least. Robin loves Valentine's Day. She says it gives her a reason and an excuse to do something special. In my opinion, Valentine's Day is stupid. It's a generic holiday where everyone is pre-programmed to give some type of gift or gesture of love. It's predictable, almost expected and mandatory that on Valentine's Day, there will be effort, there will be gifts, there will be investment, there will be something special from your significant other. I don't feel that it means much. The whole day is a preset reminder to do something special for your loved one. So it doesn't mean much. It's a holiday to spend to show that you love someone. Spend that money, honey. If someone does something when they have a huge reminder every year, it means very little. It means more the times the person who loves you does things without a holiday, without a reminder, just of themselves out of their love for you with no prompting. That means much more than getting flowers or chocolate or a stupid card on a day. Everyone does the same ritual and they are reminded to do it and spend, spend, spend. You should do these gestures without the reminder. You don't need an excuse or reminder. I feel it cheapens the value when it's just a universal generic day where everyone is programmed to be loving because everyone else is and that's what we do. Robin explains to the kids that she's gonna tell Cody her tire is flat so that she can borrow his car so that they can all decorate it for Valentine's Day. Robin is going to Christine's house where Cody will be so she can tell him she needs his car because her tire is flat. She will take the car to her house and everyone is going to participate in decorating it inside and out. And then they're going to take it back and she is going to fib and tell Cody she wrecked his car to have Cody come out and everybody will be there to surprise him. Christine is prepping for the party and she tells Cody someone asked her yesterday if she felt sorry for him because he has four wives on Valentine's Day. Cody says nobody feels sorry for him. Yes, nobody feels sorry for Cody, but Cody himself. Christine tells Cody her response was no because Cody has all year to prepare for Valentine's Day. Robin comes in playing the typical damsel in distress. It comes easy to her asking Cody, can I borrow your car? My tire is flat again. Oh, I need to run to the store really fast. And Cody reluctantly digs into his pockets for the key. And he confirms that she won't be long because he has to go too. Robin assures him it won't be long. She's going to be really quick. It'll be fast. Cody doesn't seem to really want to give her his car. He asks Christine, don't we have an air compressor in your car or in your garage? He starts walking outside to look for the compressor. Cody would rather inconvenience himself to find the compressor to try and fix Robin's tire than to loan Robin his car. That's how little he wants her driving it. He would rather be inconvenienced. He would rather make the effort to fix her tire. Robin tells Cody she has to hurry. And she tells Cody, don't worry about it. Let's not worry about it right now because they have so much to do. Don't worry. So Cody tells her, go ahead and take it. But he is very hesitant. He's reluctant and he would prefer to inconvenience himself and make an effort to find the compressor and fix that tire rather than letting Robin take his car. And you can tell. Steen says the whole thing was stressful. It was stressful the moment when Robin came in to tell Cody she needs to borrow his car and Cody wanted to go outside to get the air compressor that was right in her garage. Christine knew it would ruin everything and she was wondering how she could possibly keep Cody there inside with her. Robin gets the car back to her house and she tells the kids to be careful when they are decorating the brand new car. They needed to avoid scratching the car, taking Cody's brand new car and having hyper kids decorate it. Knowing how moody and OCD Cody seems to be, especially with his cars, seems like a risky move because even if the kids had accidentally barely scratched Cody's new baby, Cody wouldn't just be chill about it knowing this is just an object and the family were trying to do a loving thing. That scratch, regardless of how minor, would make the whole experience negative because Cody 
probably wouldn't let it roll off his back, I'm just guessing. Mary reminds the kids to only use the stickers and paint on the windows, not on the car paint. She warns them a million times to be careful. The car needed to get back to Christine so hurriedly that everyone was walking by the car as Robin was driving it back and they were blowing up balloons to fill the car, shoving them in the window. Robin drove the car as the rest of the family walked behind her and Mary was blowing even more balloons while she was walking to Christine's. Robin gets the car back and the kids and Mary and Janelle are quietly waiting outside of Christine's house in the driveway and Robin is going in to tell Cody she accidentally scratched the car. Gwen and Cody are doing decorations inside and Cody is having trouble with it and he asks Gwen if it's really that simple. Gwen is an elementary school aged child and she is easily doing whatever task with the decorations but Cody is frustrated with it and he says he's just gonna let her do it. This guy is like in his 40s at this point and he didn't know about scratch and sniff markers and here he is perplexed by a simple task his elementary school aged child is doing with no problem. He just can't get the hang of it. He can't understand how to do it. But let's remember, Cody wants to be a real estate guy. He told his buddies in Wyoming that he was taking the real estate test in a month, if not sooner. There were so many opportunities. And he took one look at that real estate book and he said, oh, I'm not going to do that. And he was intimidated by it. Cody is also the man who couldn't correctly take a simple COVID spit test. And he accidentally drank up all of the spit he spit in the tube. That's the level of intelligence we are dealing with with this guy. He just can't understand how to do these decorations Gwen is doing with no problem. Now, does Cody play dumb to avoid doing work so he won't be inconvenienced? Or is Cody dumb? Does he get flustered easily to the point where an elementary school aged child can handle the simple decorations when he, at 40 plus, just can't. Robin comes in. She is doing her best acting. She lies so easily. She twists up her face into an anxious expression while fidgeting with her hands. And when Cody sees Robin like this, his face changes immediately. He gets serious. He knows whatever it is, it's bad. Robin lies with ease. No problem. She does it so much. Robin starts telling Cody, I, I put a little. And Cody responds, you are... He sees her shaking, he sees her freaking out, but he stops himself. I think he was going to say that she was spazzing or freaking out. He smiles and he tells her, holy cow, listen, it's cool, whatever, whatever it is. Robin wants Cody to come look at the car really fast. Cody is laughing. He says Robin comes into the house and she's shaking, telling him, sorry about your car. And she handed Cody his keys, saying she didn't mean to and all this stuff. And so Cody groaned and he thought to himself, is it going to be a big dent or is it going to be a scratch? Cody comes out and his family, he later referred to as the obstacles to his goals in life in a later season, is cheering for Cody, the hero. Cody walked out and he saw a pink car and a giant surprise. They got him and Cody says it was deadly. Yeah, I'm sure deep down it killed Cody's mood when he thought his car was now less perfect just because he let Robin drive it. Cody says it was a fun surprise. The little kids got really into it. It was fun. And Cody insists he is getting Robin back in confessional. And as he says this, joking with Robin, the other wives don't look too pleased. Janelle says they get better and better at throwing family Valentine's Day parties. This party was their best yet. There was even a chocolate fountain to dip strawberries in. In the middle of the party, as Mary is helping one of the kids get food, Cody brings over Mary's bouquet very awkwardly in a robotic manner, and he tells her, Happy Valentine's Day. He's interrupting her. He awkwardly gives her a quick kiss. And Mary doesn't know how it was for everybody else when Cody was handing them the flowers, but she felt okay here. Talk about obligatory love. As she mimics, Cody handing her the flowers so robotically and so awkwardly as if it was a chore. A chore to cross off a list and not a loving gesture between a husband and a wife. Cody says that's not how he felt about it. 
Mary says that's how it felt, like obligatory love. It felt like that to her. Here are your flowers. Happy V-Day. Now it's over with. Cody gives Janelle her flowers next. He has another bouquet in his hands, and he looks confused. And Mary asks Cody, are you trying to remember whose is whose? Cody knows which one is which. One of the kids suggests that Robin's bouquet is probably the one with the purple ribbon. Cody hands Robin her flowers as she is doing stuff in the kitchen with Christine's flowers in his other hand. This feels very generic. It's a factory assembly line type of Valentine's Day for Cody and his wives. Robin thanks Cody with a quick peck and Cody lets Robin know he got vases too. He really wants to impress her. He probably knows she might reprimand him later if he didn't get those vases. She tells Cody, thank you, sweetheart. And I think she meant to say, thank you, best customer. Christine thanks Cody. He gives her a quick peck that may be more affection than Christine has gotten in years from Cody. And Christine tells Cody the flowers are gorgeous. She's beaming and she thanks him. You can tell she's grateful. Cody says his wives were all busy, so it was great. He was able to just hand everybody a bouquet of flowers and get it over with in the middle of the hecticness of cooking and serving the kids. Why didn't Cody wait until after dinner when he could say a few sweet words to each wife and make them feel loved and appreciated? Cody was playing hot potato with those bouquets. It was like they were burning his hand. Just bam, 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 assembly line. As the wives were busy doing other stuff, it was very awkward. Cody probably did it this way because he wanted to avoid having to be sweet and loving and appreciative with his wives. This felt like a man doing a chore, crossing it off a list. It didn't feel like a sincere, sentimental, heartfelt gesture. It felt like a filming opportunity. Mary got it right when she called it obligatory love. That's what it looked like, and that's probably what it felt like for Cody's wives. Mary didn't know what to do with her bouquet after Cody handed it to her. Robin says the three of them were walking around the kitchen with one hand carrying their bouquets and they were stirring with the other hand, one-handed doing stuff in the kitchen. Christine jokes that Cody is a keeper. That didn't age well. Of course, Christine is now engaged to David and she seems to be brighter than ever before. Let's hope David treats Christine right the way she deserves. Cody hands out stuffed animals and heart-shaped chocolate boxes to all of his kids. And I have to say that was sweet and it was very thoughtful. If Cody just waited to pass out the bouquets until now, when he is passing out the gifts to his kids with a few sweet words, it would have felt so much more authentic for his wives. Cody says Valentine's Day is this monogamous holiday that they have transformed into a family event. To avoid any awkwardness, they always celebrate Valentine's Day as a family. Cody is now seated on his recliner reading a V-Day card that says, To my husband on it, and I wonder if it's from Robin. Cody's reading very attentively. Cody announces to the family that tomorrow afternoon they are meeting with Tanya, the loan officer who will help them get a loan for the houses they are talking about in the cul-de-sac. Tomorrow, they find out if they will be able to buy the homes or not. Cody tells cameras it's a very important meeting, and for the first time in a very long time, it makes him very, very nervous. Cody gets all his kids to gently say, Happy Valentine's Day on three. He wants the sentimental moment for the filming. The wives and Cody go to meet Tanya to see if they're going to be qualified to buy the four homes. Robin hopes Tanya is going to hand them a miracle, of course, because she's entitled to miracles. Because Robin says they need to qualify for the loans, and they also need to be able to afford the payments. She says it's a tall order. Robin probably knows her financial situation and her credit score fucks everyone else over. She had the massive debt, mostly at Victoria's Secret, and the different aliases as well. Tanya explains that the stressful part of this venture with the Browns is it's going to be all or nothing. It's four properties together with the same end. It's going to be a challenge. The good news is they have got some financing available for the four properties. Janelle is amazed. She didn't think it would be possible at all. 
Cody tells Tanya, good job. You rock. He's a rock star. He's chill. He's cool. He has this tight leather jacket on and this devil may care attitude. Janelle says when they sat down and Tanya said she had something for them, she was floored by that. Robin was sitting there. Of course, she's been sitting there. She always starts every sentence with sitting there. Robin was sitting there holding her breath when she said they were qualified. Robin was waiting for the other shoe to drop. Robin thought, great, but what's the payment? Now that they had a possibility of financing, Cody wonders, what's the rest of the story? Tanya explains the financing will be unconventional. They will have to do some less than traditional financing initially to make this work. Tanya explains that private lending is a larger down payment and a higher interest rate. Normally, it's an interest only loan. It's something you don't want to be in for very long. So the sooner the Browns can get into a traditional loan, the better. The Browns will have to pay back what they borrow times two or three or four. It's not really something a smart person would go for financially. But if being in the four homes close together for the family supersedes the shit financial situation they're putting themselves in, I guess for them it's worth it. If it was me personally, under no circumstances would I do anything like this. I would never put myself in a financial situation I may not be able to get out of with so much interest. If I can't reasonably afford something, I'm not doing it end of. Interest isn't worth it under any circumstances. No one has to live beyond their means. It's a choice. Do you want to be a slave to money and have things you can't afford? Or would you rather live within your means and struggle less because you don't owe? To have the option to live above your means, you will pay through your teeth a million times over and you will keep paying. It's not worth it. Look at the situation the Browns put themselves in. Also, Cody could sell the wives a dream with no intention of ever building on Coyote Pass. Robin didn't give a fuck about the family. She bought her goblins lair, Cody thinks is a status symbol, with money from Mary and Janelle's Vegas house proceeds, and also using the joint family account. Christine purchased a home in Flagstaff with access to the joint family account, and she sold that home when she pieced out. Mary was renting, and Janelle got the RV, begging Cody to please pay off the land so she could build before she separated from him. And Cody kept saying the money wasn't there. And then he made the excuse that he wasn't helping Janelle because he didn't feel respected by her. And as we know, Janelle recounted in later seasons that she wasn't given the same access to the joint family account that she probably was the primary contributor to that Robin and Christine were able to use in order to get homes. And she said the money was there, but she is the one who was in charge of the accounting and the taxes and the budget. And she noticed that there was a lot of expenses that weren't necessary, that were luxuries that the family didn't need to have. So it was never really a priority for Cody to build on the land for his family or to pay off the land so that Janelle could build. Cody never intended on building homes on that land. That land was a dream to sell his wives, a false hope. And let's not forget the time when Cody came back from the lawyers just giddy about wanting to build rental properties on that land since there is a shortage in Flagstaff so he can rake in the big bucks and finally be the real estate guru, the entrepreneur, the businessman he delusionally fancies himself to be. Back at the meeting, Tanya explains that there is a down payment that has to go in place for the initial loan, and it's 40% per property. Everyone is shocked by this. They really shouldn't be shocked. They don't have the best finances, and they're applying as three single moms and one married couple. Plus, Robin has those aliases and a boatload of debt. They can only get a private loan, and the interest is going to be up the ass, so it isn't shocking that the down payment would be 40% per property to get this loan. I'm not sure what the Browns expected with their financial situation. I think they are lucky they even got financing at all. And Tanya probably had to do gymnastics to even get this, most likely. 
they should really feel grateful they are even able to get a loan at all when it's four properties with the same shit finances. Cody says when Tanya delivers the terms, it's double the cost of what they anticipated it would be. Janelle thinks the family needs to discuss it first because they're talking about a lot of money here. It's a frightening amount of money. Robin says it was surprisingly heartbreaking for her. She remembers sitting there trying to choke back tears and she had realized how much she actually bought into the dream. Mona, the real estate agent, wasn't able to attend this meeting, but she has some bad news. One of the properties has been sold. Cody says his mind did a complete reversal. It's double the down payment, double what their rent is, and now one of the homes is sold. Cody says that's his excuse to move on to something affordable. That's immediately where Cody went. Cody says they should be buying homes that are affordable. He says the market is weak. And Cody thinks they have seen a couple of houses in cul-de-sacs. And if they could nail two homes, they could start that as the hub and start gathering anybody, the rest of the family, who needs to move to that area. They could make it work. Robin tells Cody he is so killing their dream by saying that, though. Cody says this is an open forum, but if they are buying affordable homes now, they aren't killing the dream. They are just postponing it. Robin explains she was sitting there. Again, this is the third sitting there in like a five-minute window. Robin sure does a lot of sitting. She loves sitting on her ass. She doesn't like to work too hard. She doesn't like to break a sweat. She was sitting there, sort of bitter, trying really hard not to get emotional because they had just been up against so many walls and it just felt like another wall. No one said life was easy. There are always going to be walls as you progress through life, but it's how you react and how you feel about it and how you handle it that says a lot about the person you are and your character. Robin gets bitter when she's faced with walls. Some people get motivated. Cody says Tanya was under a lot of pressure because he told her they needed to qualify for houses immediately. They want to move into homes before Logan graduates. He acknowledges that Tanya pulled off a miracle, but then one of the houses sold. So now they have to go back and tell their kids this won't work. It's not happening. The family is gathered and Cody tells his kids they met with the lending banker today and there is good news and bad news. The good news is they can be financed on the homes, but the bad news is one of the homes sold. Leo explains that their parents say they're going to get these houses, but they don't really feel like they are because the parents say a lot of times, oh yeah, we're going to do this and it doesn't ever happen. So Leo just tries to not get their hopes up. Mary tells the kids that they aren't going to get the homes, and she reminds them about how they talked about how they all wanted four homes or none of them at all. And one home sold, so now they're not going to do it. Hunter feels as long as the homes are all in the same gated community, he doesn't see why not. He looks so disappointed. The kids look sad and deflated with this news. Because Cody sold them this dream and he got them excited and hopeful and sentimental with the kites around Christmas, seeing the property, telling the kids all the details. So now what they thought was a reality has vanished into thin air. Janelle promises the kids they're going to meet with Mona, their real estate agent, and they still want to make this happen. She insists they're still looking. Janelle feels like they're at this critical stage where the kids have got to trust that they can fulfill something. Janelle knows the kids are miserable, they're disappointed, they're sad and let down. Yet again, when they were given all of this hope, they were sold a dream, they were led to believe in the dream. The kids were led to believe it was a likely possibility that they would all be together. The kids went through a lot to get them united with the Vegas move. Cody exaggerated by telling them, we move or we lose our family. Then some kids suffered from anxiety and depression and stress. And as a kid, if you move a lot, it does affect you. You aren't able to grow up with your same set of friends. And growing up, your school and your social life is your whole world. You have to go to a new place. And compared to Utah, Vegas is like culture shock. It's practically like another country. 
The kids aren't necessarily going to fit into the social order in the same way they did in Utah. Their whole world changes. Everything a kid knows changes when they have to move. And they also have less time and attention from their dad. They see him less, and when he's around, he phones it in. And the moms are struggling with life in Vegas as well. The moms are struggling in their marriages, other than Robin, of course. And now the adults have promised the kids, we will live next door to each other. It's happening. They showed the kids the cul-de-sac. They gave the kids hope. The kids were left with the feeling that it was all but done, only to learn it's not happening and a home sold. They don't get to live near their other moms and brothers and sisters anytime soon. Imagine how disheartening and deflating and disappointing this is for some of the kids, particularly the kids who aren't crazy about Vegas. This is a lot, and Janelle is right. They have to show their kids these aren't empty words, that they will follow through. Cody says they have to keep looking for a home, and they're going to keep looking. Cody explains this isn't over. They are just moving to the next step. Logan says the parents always give them the best scenario, and a lot of times it's just not how it is. Logan isn't sure if they're going to get the houses or not. He doesn't know. With kids, as harsh as honesty and reality are, it hurts them less than lying to them or selling a dream or selling false hope. Before you are sure there is something definite. If you sell a dream enough to a kid and it doesn't come to fruition, they won't trust you. If you notice, kids tell it like it is. And when an adult gives them a song and dance and they say, this is going to happen, and it doesn't happen, all it will do is create mistrust and resentment ultimately, and a lot more hurt than the truth or reality would have inflicted. I'm really glad that ultimately they got these homes because the kids deserved it, and they deserved a boost in morale and some hope and some silver lining after all they went through. That does it for this episode. To my YouTube listeners, don't forget to like, subscribe, and let me know your thoughts in the comments section if you like. To my podcast listeners, don't forget to follow this podcast wherever you listen and be sure to rate it. Give it all the stars. I'll be back next week with the next episode of My Sister Wives Rewatch, Season 4, Episode 7, Brown Boys Do Vegas, where Cody and his brothers hit the town and they do man stuff. Grr! Like the shooting range where Cody gets to play with his assault rifle he got for Christmas. Thanks for listening. I'll see you soon. Bye.